Chapter Number Seventeen of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Describes a Frenchman's visit. Monsieur Goslin, Sir Henry, Hill announced, entering his master's room one morning, a fortnight later, just as the blind man was about to descend to breakfast. He's in the library, sir. Goslin exclaimed the baronet in great surprise. I'll go to him at once, and he'll serve breakfast for two in the library, and tell Miss Gabrielle that I do not wish to be disturbed this morning. Very well, Sir Henry, and the man bowed and went down the broad oak staircase. Goslin here, without any announcement, exclaimed the baronet, speaking to himself. Something must have happened. I wonder what it can be. He tugged at his collar to render it more comfortable and then with a groping hand on the broad balustrade he felt his way down the stairs and along the corridor to the big library where a stout grey-haired frenchman came forward to greet him warmly after carefully closing the door ah oh, mon cher ami he began and speaking in french he inquired eagerly after the baronet's health he was rather long-faced with beard worn short and pointed and his dark deep-set eyes and his countenance showed a fund of good humour this visit is quite unexpected exclaimed sir henry you are not due till the twentieth no but circumstances have arisen which made my journey imperative so i left the gare du nord at four yesterday afternoon was at charing cross at eleven had half an hour to catch the scotch express at king's cross and here i am oh my dear goslin you always move so quickly you're simply a marvel of alertness the other smiled and with a shrug of the shoulders said i really don't know why i should have earned a reputation as a rapid traveller except perhaps by that trip i made last year from paris to constantinople when i remained exactly thirty-eight minutes in the sultan's capital but i did my business there nevertheless even though i got through quicker than messieurs les touristes of the most estimable agent's cook you want a wash eh i know my friend i washed at the hotel in perth where i took my morning coffee when i come to scotland i carry no baggage save my toothbrush in my pocket and a clean collar across my chest its ends held by my braces the baronet laughed heartily his friend was always most resourceful and ingenious he was a mystery to all at glencardine and to lady Hayburn most of all his visits were always unexpected while as to who he really was or whence he came nobody not even gabrielle herself knew at times the frenchman would take his meals alone with sir henry in the library while at others he would lunch with her ladyship and her guests on these latter occasions he proved himself a most amusing cosmopolitan and at the same time exhibited an extreme courtliness towards every one his manner was quite charming yet his presence there was always puzzling and had given rise to considerable speculation hill came in and after helping the frenchman to take off his heavy leather-lined travelling coat laid a small table for two and prepared for breakfast then when he had served it and left goslin rose and crossing to the door pushed the little brass bolt into its socket returning to his chair opposite the blind man whose food hill had already cut up for him he exclaimed in a very calm serious voice speaking in french i want you to hear what i have to say sir henry without exciting yourself unduly something has occurred something very strange and remarkable the other dropped his knife and sat statuesque and expressionless go on he said hoarsely tell me the worst at once the worst has not yet happened it is that which i'm dreading well what has happened is is the secret out the secret is safe for the present the blind man drew a long breath well that's one thing to be thankful for he gasped i was afraid you were going to tell me that the facts were exposed they may yet be exposed the mysterious visitor exclaimed that's where lies the danger we have been betrayed eh you may as well admit the ugly truth at once goslin i do not conceal it sir henry we have by whom by somebody here in this house here what do you mean somebody in my own house yes the greek affair is known they have been put upon their guard in athens by whom cried the baronet starting from his chair by somebody whom we cannot trace somebody who must have had access to your papers 
no one has had access to my papers i always take good care of that goslin very good care of that the affair has leaked out at your end not at mine at our end we are always circumspect the frenchman said calmly rest assured that nobody but we ourselves are aware of our operations or intentions we know only too well that only revelation would assuredly bring upon us disaster but a revelation has actually been made exclaimed sir henry bending forward therefore the worst is to be feared exactly that is what i am endeavouring to convey the betrayal must have come from your end i expect not from here i regret to assert that it came from here from this very room how do you know that because in athens they have a complete copy of one of the documents which you showed me on the last occasion i was here and which we have never had in our possession the blind man was silent the allegation admitted of no argument my daughter gabrielle is the only person who has seen it and she understands nothing of our affairs as you know quite well she may have copied it my daughter would never betray me goslin said sir henry in a hard distinct voice rising from the table and slowly walking down the long book-lined room has no one else been able to open your safe and examine its contents asked the frenchman glancing over to the small steel door let into the wall close to where he was sitting no one though i'm blind do you consider me a fool surely i recognize only too well how essential is secrecy have i not always taken the most extraordinary precautions you have sir henry i quite admit that indeed the precautions you've taken would if known to the world be regarded well as simply amazing i hope the world will never know the truth it will know the truth they have copies in athens if there is a traitor as we have now proved the existence of one then we can never in future rest secure at any moment another exposure may result with this attendant disaster the baronet halted before one of the long windows the morning sunshine falling full upon his sad gray face he drew a long sigh and said goslin do not let us discuss the future tell me exactly what is the present situation the present situation the frenchman said in a dry matter-of-fact voice is one full of peril for us you have over there in your safe a certain paper a confidential report which you received direct from vienna it was brought to you by special messenger because its nature was not such as should be sent through the post a trusted official of the austrian ministry of foreign affairs brought it here to whom did he deliver it to gabrielle she signed a receipt and she broke the seals no i was present and she handed it to me i broke the seals myself she read it over to me ah ejaculated the frenchman suspiciously it is unfortunate that you are compelled to entrust our secrets to a woman my daughter is my best friend indeed perhaps my only friend then you have enemies who has not true we all of us have enemies replied the mysterious visitor but in this case how do you account for that report falling into the hands of the people in athens who keeps the key of the safe i do it is never out of my possession at night what do you do with it i hide it in a secret place in my room and i sleep with the door locked then as far as you are aware nobody has ever had possession of your key not even mademoiselle your daughter not even gabrielle i always lock and unlock the safe myself but she has access to its contents when it is open the visitor remarked acting as your secretary she is of course aware of a good deal of your business no you are mistaken have we not arranged a code in order to prevent her from satisfying her woman's natural inquisitiveness that's admitted but the document in question though somewhat guarded is sufficiently plain to any one acquainted with the nature of our negotiations the blind man crossed to the safe and with the key upon his chain opened it and after fumbling in one of the long iron drawers revealed within took out a big oblong envelope orange colored and secured with five black seals now however broken this he handed to his friend saying read it again to refresh your memory i know myself what it says pretty well by heart mr goslin drew forth the paper within and read the lines of close even writing it was in german he stood near the window as he read while sir henry remained near the open safe 
Hill tapped at the bolted door, but his master replied that he did not wish to be disturbed. Yes, the Frenchman said at last, the copy they have in Athens is exact, word for word. They may have obtained it from Vienna. No, it came from here. There are some penciled comments in your daughter's handwriting. They were dictated by me. Exactly, and they appear in the copy now in the hands of the people in Athens. Thus it is doubly proved that it was this actual document which was copied. But by whom? Ah, sighed the helpless man, his face drawn and paler than usual. Gabrielle is the only person who has had sight of it. Mademoiselle surely could not have copied it, remarked the Frenchman. Has she a lover? Yes, the son of a neighbor of mine, a very worthy young fellow. Goslin grunted dubiously. It was apparent that he suspected her of trickery. Information such as had been supplied to the Greek government would, he knew, be paid for and at a high price. Had Mademoiselle's lover had a hand in that revelation? I would not suggest for a single moment, Sir Henry, that Mademoiselle, your daughter, would act in any way against your personal interests. But— But what? demanded the blind man fiercely, turning towards his visitor. Well, it is peculiar— very peculiar, to say the least. Sir Henry was silent. Within himself he was compelled to admit that certain suspicion attached to Gabrielle. And yet, was she not his most devoted? Nay, his only friend? Someone has copied the report, that's evident, he said in a low, hard voice, reflecting deeply, and by doing so has placed us in a position of grave peril, Sir Henry. Eminent peril, remarked the visitor. I see in this an attempt to obtain further knowledge of our affairs. We have a secret enemy who, it seems, has found a vulnerable point in our armor. Surely, my own daughter cannot be my enemy? cried the blind man in dismay. You say she has a lover, remarked the Frenchman, speaking slowly and with deliberation. May not he be the instigator? Walter Murray is upright and honorable, replied the blind man. And yet... A long-drawn sigh prevented the conclusion of that sentence. "'Ah, I know,' exclaimed the mysterious visitor in a tone of sympathy. "'You are uncertain in your conclusions because of your terrible affliction. "'Sometimes, alas, my dear friend, you are imposed upon because you are blind.' "'Yes,' responded the other man bitterly. "'That is the truth, Goslin. "'Because I cannot see like other men, I have been deceived, "'foully and grossly deceived and betrayed. "'But, but,' he cried, they thought to ruin me, and I've tricked them, Goslin. Yes, tricked them. Have no fear. For the present, our secrets are our own. End of chapter 17had come and gone. The rush to the north had commenced from London, from Euston, St. Pancras, and King's Cross. The night trains for Scotland had run in triplicate, crowded by men and gun cases and kit bags, while gloomy old Perth station was a scene of unwanted activity each morning. At Glencardine there were little or no grouse. Therefore it was not until later that Sir Henry invited his usual party. Gabrielle had been south to visit one of her girlfriends near Durham, and the week of her absence her afflicted father had spent in dark loneliness, for Flockhart had gone to London, and her ladyship was away on a fortnight's visit to the Pelhams, down at New Galloway. On the last day of August, however, Gabrielle returned, being followed a few hours later by Lady Hayburn, who had travelled up by way of Stirling and Creef Junction while that same night eight men forming the shooting party arrived by the day express from the south the gathering was a merry one the guests were the same who came up there every year some of them friends of sir henry in the days of his brilliant career others friends of his wife the shooting at glencardine was always excellent and stuart wise and serious had prophesied first-class sport walter murray was in london while gabrielle had been at durham he had travelled up there, spent the night at the Three Tons, and met her next morning, in that pretty wooded walk they called the Banks. Devoted to her as he was, he could not bear any long separation, while she, on her part, 
was gratified by this attention not without some difficulty did she succeed in getting away from her friends to meet him for a provincial town is not like london and any stranger is always in the public eye but they spent a delightful couple of hours together strolling along the footpath through the meadows in the direction of finkel priory there was no eavesdroppers and he with his arm linked in hers repeated the story of his all-conquering love she listened in silence then raising her fine clear eyes to his said i know walter i know you love me and i love you also ah he sighed if you would only be frank with me dearest if you would only be as frank with me as i am with you sadly she shook her head but made no reply he saw that a shadow had clouded her brow that she still clung to her strange secret and at length when they retraced their steps back to the city he reluctantly took leave of her and half hour later was speeding south again towards york and king's cross the opening day of the partridge season proved bright and pleasant the men were out early and the ladies a gay party including gabrielle joined them at luncheon spread on a mossy bank about three miles from the castle several of the male guests were particularly attentive to the dainty sweet-faced girl whose charming manner and fresh beauty attracted them but gabrielle's heart was with walter always she loved him yes she told herself so a dozen times each day and yet was not the barrier between them insurmountable ah if he only knew if he only knew the blind man was left alone nearly the whole of, of that day his daughter had wanted to remain with him but he, he would not hear of it my dear child he had said you must go out and lunch you really must assist your mother in entertaining the people but dear dad i much prefer to remain with you and help she protested yesterday the professor sent you five more bronze matrices of ecclesiastical seals we haven't yet examined them we'll do so to-night dear he said you go out to-day i'll amuse myself all right perhaps i'll go for a little walk therefore the girl had against her inclination joined the luncheon party where foremost of all to have her little attentions was a rather foppish young stockbroker named girdlestone who had been up there shooting the previous year and had on that occasion flirted with her furiously during her absence her father tried to resume his knitting an occupation which he had long ago been compelled to resort to in order to employ his time but he soon put it down with a sigh rose and taking his soft brown felt hat and stout stick tapped his way through the great hall and out into the park he felt the warmth upon his cheek as he passed slowly along down the broad drive ah he murmured to himself if only i could once again see god's sunlight if i could only see the greenery of nature and the face of my darling child and he sighed brokenly and went on his chin sunk upon his breast a despairing hopeless man surely no figure more pathetic than this could be found in the whole of scotland upon him he had been showered honour great wealth all indeed that makes life worth living and yet deprived of sight he existed in that world of darkness deceived and plotted against by all about him his grey countenance was hard and thoughtful as he passed slowly along tapping the ground before him for he was thinking ever thinking of the declaration of his french visitor he had been betrayed but by whom his thoughts were wandering back to those days when he could see those well-remembered days when he had held the house in silence by his brilliant oratory and when the papers next day had leading articles concerning his speeches he recollected his time-mellowed old club in st james's street boodles of which he had been so fond then came his affliction the thought of it all struck him suddenly and clenching his hands he murmured some inarticulate words through his teeth they sounded strangely like a threat next instant however he laughed bitterly to himself the dry harsh laugh of a man into whose very soul the iron had entered in the distance he could hear the shots of his guests those men who accepted his hospitality and who among themselves agreed that he was a terrible bore poor old fellow they came up there with perhaps two exceptions to eat his dinners drink his choice wines and shoot his birds but begrudged him more than ten minutes or so of their company each day in the billiard-room of an evening as he sat upon one of the long lounges 
they would perhaps deign to chat with him but alas he knew that he was only as a wet blanket to his wife's guests hence he kept himself so much to the library his own domain that night he spent half an hour in the billiard room in order to hear what sport they had had but very soon escaped and with gabrielle returned again to the library to fulfil his promise and examine the seal matrices which the professor had sent to where they sat came bursts of boisterous laughter and of the waltz music of the pianola in the hall for in the shooting season the echoes of the fine mansion were awakened by the merriment of as gay a crowd as any had assembled in the highlands sir henry heard it the sounds jarred upon his nerves mirth such as theirs was debarred him for ever and he had now become gloomy and misanthropic he sat fingering those big oval matrices of bronze listening to gabrielle's voice deciphering the inscriptions and explaining what was meant and what was possibly their history one which sir henry declared to be the gem of them all bore the manus day for the device and was the seal of archbishop richard eleven seventy four through eighty four several documents bearing impressions of this seal were he said preserved at canterbury and in the british museum but here the actual seal itself had come to light with all the enthusiasm of an expert he lingered over the matrix feeling it carefully with the tips of his fingers tracing the device with the nail of his forefinger splendid he declared the lettering is a most excellent specimen of early lombardic and then he gave the girl the titles of several works which she got down from the shelves and from which she read extracts after some careful search the sulphur casts sent with the matrices she placed carefully with her father's collection and during the remainder of the evening they were occupied in replying to several letters regarding estate matters at eleven o'clock she kissed her father good night and passed out to the hall where the pianola was still going and where the merriment was still in full swing for a quarter of an hour she was compelled to remain with the insepid young ass bertie girdlestone a man who patronized musical comedy nightly and afterwards supped regularly at the savoy then she escaped at last to her room exchanging her pretty gown of turquoise chiffon for an easy wrap she took up a novel and switching on her green shaded reading lamp sat down to enjoy a quiet hour before retiring quickly she became engrossed in the story and though the stable chimes sounded each half hour she remained undisturbed by them it was half past two before she had reached the happy denouement of the book and closing it she rose to take off her trinkets having divested herself of bracelets rings and necklet she placed her hands to her ears there was only one earring the other was missing they were sapphires a present from walter on her last birthday he had sent them to her from yokohama and she greatly prized them therefore at risk of being seen in her dressing-gown by any of the male guests who might still be astir for she knew they always played billiards until very late she took off her little blue satin slippers and stole out along the corridor and down the broad staircase the place was in darkness but she turned on the light and again when she reached the hall she must have dropped her earring in the library of that she felt sure servants were so careless that if she left it it might easily be swept up in the morning and lost forever the thought had caused her to search for it at once as she approached the library door she thought she heard the sound of someone within on her opening the door however all was in darkness she laughed at her apprehension in an instant she touched the switch and the place became flooded with a soft mellow light from lamps cunningly concealed behind the bookcases against the wall at the same moment however she detected a movement behind one of the bookcases against which she stood with sudden resolution and fearlessness she stepped forward to ascertain its cause her eyes at that instant fell upon a sight which caused her to start and stand dumb with amazement straight before her the door of her father's safe stood open beside it startled at the sudden interruption stood a man in evening dress with a small electric lamp in his clenched hand a pair of dark evil eyes met hers in defiance the eyes of james flockhart you she gasped yes he laughed dryly don't be afraid it's only i but by jove how very charming you look in that gown i'd love to get a snapshot of you just as you stand now what are you doing here examining my father's papers she demanded quickly her small hands clenched 
my dear girl he replied with affected unconcern that's my own business you really ought to have been in bed long ago it isn't discreet you know to be down here with me at this hour i demand to know what you are doing here she cried firmly and my dear little girl i refuse to tell you was his decisive answer very well then i shall alarm the house and explain to my father what i have discovered End of chapter 18、Chapter、Shows Gabrielle Defiant Gabrielle crossed quickly to one of the long windows, which she unbolted and flung open, expecting to hear the shrill whir of the burglar alarm. Which every night Hill switched on before retiring. My dear little girl, exclaimed the man, smiling as he strolled leisurely across to her with a cool, perfect unconcern, which showed how completely he was master. Why create such a beastly draught? Nothing will happen, for I've already seen to those wires. You're a thief, she cried, drawing herself up angrily. I shall go straight to my father and tell him at once. You are at perfect liberty to act exactly as you choose, was Flockhart's answer, as he bowed before her with an irritating mock politeness. But before you go, pray allow me to finish these most interesting documents, some of which I believe are in your very neat handwriting. My father's business is his alone, and you have no right whatever to pry into it. I thought you were posing as his friend, she cried in bitter protest, and as she stood with both her hands clenched. I am his friend, he declared. Some day, Gabrielle, you will know the truth of how near he is to disaster, and how I am risking much in an endeavor to save him. I don't believe you, she exclaimed in undisguised disgust. In your heart, there is not one single spark of sympathy with him in his affliction, or with me in my ghastly position. Your position is your own seeking, my dear child, was his cold response. I gave you full warning long ago. You can't deny that. You conspired with Lady Hayburn against me, she cried. I have discovered more about it than you think, and now I openly defy you, Mr. Flockhart. Please understand that. Good, he replied, still unruffled. I quite understand. You will pardon my resuming, won't you? And walking back to the open safe, he drew forth a small bundle of papers from a drawer. Then he threw himself into a leather armchair and proceeded to untie the tape and examine the documents one by one. As though in eager search of something. Though Lady Hayburn may be your friend, I am quite sure even she would never for a moment countenance such a dastardly action as this, cried the girl, crimsoning in anger. You come here, accept my father's hospitality, and make pretense of being his friend and adviser, yet you are conspiring against him, as you have done against myself. So far as you are concerned, my dear Gabrielle, he laughed. Without deigning to look up from the papers he was scanning, I offered you my friendship, but you refused it. Friendship? she cried in sarcasm. Your friendship, Mr. Flockhart. What, pray, is it worth? You surely know what people are saying, the construction they are placing upon your friendship for Lady Hayburn? The misconstruction, you mean, he exclaimed airily, correcting her. Well, to me it matters not a single jot. The world is always ill disposed and ill natured. A woman can surely have a male friend without being subject to hostile and venomous criticism? When the male friend is an honest man, said the girl meaningly. He shrugged his shoulders and continued reading, as though utterly disregarding her presence. What should she do? How should she act? She knew quite well that from those papers he could gather no knowledge of her father's affairs, unless he held some secret knowledge of the true meaning of those cryptic terms and allusions. To her they were all as Hebrew. Only that very day, m r Goslin had again made one of those unexpected visits, remaining from eleven in the morning until three, afterwards taking his leave and driving back in the car to Octeradar Station. She had not seen him, but he had brought from Paris for her a big box of chocolates tied with violet ribbons, as had been his habit for quite a couple of years past. She was a particular favorite with the polite middle aged Frenchmen. Her father's demeanor was always more thoughtful and serious after the stranger's visits. Business matters put before him by his visitor always, it seemed, required much deep thought and ample consideration. 
some papers brought to her father by goslin she had placed in the safe earlier that evening and these she recognized were now in flockart's hands she had not read them herself and had no idea of their contents they were to her never interesting mr flockart she exclaimed very firmly at last i ask you to kindly replace those papers in my father's safe relock it and hand me the key that i certainly refuse to do was the man's defiant reply bowing as he spoke you would prefer then that i should go up to my father and explain all i have seen i repeat what i have already said you are perfectly at liberty to tell whom you like it makes no difference whatever to me and well i don't want to be disturbed just now rising he walked across to the writing-table and taking a piece of note-paper bearing the hayburn crest rapidly penciled some memoranda upon it he was it seemed taking a copy of one of the documents suddenly she sprang towards him crying give me that paper give it to me at once i say it is my father's he straightened himself from the table pulled down his white dress vest with its amethyst buttons and looking straight into her face ordered her to leave the room i shall not go she answered boldly i have discovered a thief in my father's house therefore my duty is to remain here no surely your duty is to go upstairs and tell him and he bent again resuming his rapid memoranda well he asked defiantly a few moments later seeing that she had not moved aren't you going i shall not leave you here alone don't i might run away with some of the ornaments oh yes exclaimed the girl bitterly you taunt me because you are well aware of my helplessness of what occurred on that never-to-be-forgotten afternoon of how completely you have me in your power i see it all you defy me well knowing that you could in a moment bring upon me a vengeance terrible and complete it is all horrible she cried covering her face with her hands i know that i am in your power and you have no pity no remorse i gave you full warning he declared placing the papers upon the table and looking at her i gave you your choice you cannot blame me you had ample time and opportunity but i still have one man who loves me a man who will yet stand my friend and defend me even against you walter murray he laughed with a quick gesture of disregard you believe him to be your friend recollect my dear gabrielle that men are deceivers ever so it seems in your case she exclaimed with poignant bitterness you have brought scandalous comment upon my father's name and yet you are utterly unconcerned because as i have already told you your father is my friend and it is his money which you spend so freely she said in a low hard voice of reproach it comes from him his money he exclaimed quickly what do you mean what do you imply simply that among my father's accounts a short time back i found two checks drawn by lady heyburn in your favour and told your father of them of course he exclaimed with sarcasm a remarkable discovery eh i told him nothing was her bold reply not because i wished to shield you but because i did not wish to pain him unduly he has worry sufficient in all conscience your devotion is really most charming the man declared calmly leaning against the table and examining her critically from head to foot sir henry believes in you you are his dutiful daughter pure good and all that he sneered i wonder what he would say if he well if he knew just a little of the truth of what happened that day at chantilly the truth ah and you would tell him you she gasped in a broken voice her sweet innocent face blanched to the lips in an instant you would drag my good name into the mire and blast my life for ever with just as little compunction as you would shoot a rabbit i know i know you only too well mr flockhart i stand in your way i am in your way as well as in lady hayburn's you are only waiting on opportunity to wreck my life and crush me once i am away from here my poor father will be helpless in your hands dear me he sneered how very tragic you are becoming that dressing gown really makes you appear quite like a heroine in a provincial melodrama i ought now to have a revolver and threaten you and then this scene would be complete for the stage wouldn't it but for goodness sake don't remain here in the cold any longer my dear little girl run off to bed and forget that to-night you've been walking in your sleep not until i see that safe relocked and you give me the false key of yours if you will not then you shall this very night have an opportunity of telling the truth to my father i am prepared to bear my shame and all of its consequences the words froze upon her pale lips on the lawn outside the half-open glass door there was at that moment a light movement 
the tapping of a walking stick hush cried flockart remember what i can tell him if i choose in an instant she saw the fragile figure of her father in soft felt hat and black coat creeping almost noiselessly past the window he had been out for one of his nocturnal walks for he sometimes went out alone when suffering from insomnia he had just returned the blind man went forward only a few paces farther but finding that he had proceeded too far had returned and discovered the open door near it stood the pair not daring now to move lest the blind man's quick ears should detect their footsteps gabrielle gabrielle my dear exclaimed the baronet but though her heart beat quickly the girl did not reply she knew however that the old man could almost read her innermost thoughts the ominous words of flockart rang in her ears yes he could tell a terrible and awful truth which must be concealed at all hazards i felt sure i heard gabrielle's voice how curious murmured the old man as his feet fell noiselessly upon the thick turkey carpet gabrielle dear he called but his daughter stood there breathless and silent not daring to move a muscle plain it was that while passing across the lawn outside he heard her voice he had overheard her declaration that she was prepared to bear the consequences of her disgrace across the room the blind man groped his hand held before him as was his habit strange remarkably strange he remarked to himself quite aloud i'm never mistaken in gabrielle's voice gabrielle dear where are you why don't you speak it's too late tonight to play practical jokes flockart knew that he had left the safe door open yet he dared not move across the room to close it the sightless man would detect the slightest movement in that dead silence of the night with great care he left the girl's side and a single stride brought him to the large writing-table where he secured the document together with the pencilled memoranda of its purport both of which he slipped into his pocket unobserved gabrielle dared not breathe her discovery there meant her ruin the man who held her in his toils cast her an evil threatening glance raising his clenched fist in menace as though daring her to make the slightest movement in his dark eyes showed a sinister expression and his nether lip was hard she was alas utterly and completely in his power the safe was some distance away and in order to reach and close it he would be compelled to pass the man in blue spectacles now standing puzzled and surprised in the centre of the great book-lined department both of them could escape by the open window but to do so would be to court discovery should the baronet find his safe standing open in that case the alarm would be raised and they both would be found outside the house instead of within slowly the old man drew his thin hand across his furrowed brow and then as a sudden recollection dawned upon him he cried ah the window why that's strange when i went out i closed it but it was open open as i came in some one some one has entered here in my absence with both his thin wasted hands outstretched he walked quickly to the safe cleverly avoiding the furniture in his course and the next second discovered that the iron door stood wide open thieves he gasped aloud hoarsely as the truth dawned upon him my papers gabrielle's voice what can all this mean and the next moment he opened the door crying help and endeavouring to alarm the household in an instant flockart dashed forward towards the safe and without being observed by gabrielle had slipped the key into his own pocket gabrielle cried the blind man you are here in the room i know you are you cannot deceive me i smell that new scent which your aunt annie sent you upon your handkerchief why don't you speak to me yes dad she answered at last in a low strained voice i i am here then what is meant by my safe being open he asked sternly as all that goslin had told him a little while before flashed across his memory why have you obtained a key to it i have no key was her quick answer come here let me take your hand with great reluctance her eyes fixed upon flockhart's face she did as she was bid and as her father took her soft hand in his he said in a stern harsh tone full of suspicion and quite unusual to him you are trembling gabrielle trembling because because of my unexpected appearance eh the fair girl with the sweet face and dainty figure was silent what could she reply 
End of chapter 19「Tells of Flockhart's Triumph」What are you doing here at this hour? Gabrielle's father demanded slowly, releasing her hand. Why are you prying into my affairs? He had not detected Flockhart's presence, and believed himself alone with his daughter. The man's glance again at met Gabrielle's and she saw in his eyes a desperate look. To tell the truth would, she knew, alas, cause the exposure of her secret and her disgrace. On both sides had she suddenly become hemmed in by a deadly peril. Dad, she cried suddenly, do I not know all about your affairs already? Do I not act as your secretary? With what motive should I open your safe? Without response, the blind man moved back to the open door, and placing his hand within, fingered one of the long iron drawers. It was unlocked, and he drew it forth. Some papers were within, blue, legal-looking papers, which his daughter had never seen. Yes, he exclaimed aloud, just as I thought. This drawer has been opened, and my private affairs pried into. Tell me, Gabrielle, where is young Murray just at present? In Paris, I believe. He left London unexpectedly three days ago. Paris, echoed the old man. Ah, he added, Goslin was right, quite right. And so you, my daughter, in whom I placed all my trust, my, my only friend, have betrayed me, he added brokenly. I have not betrayed you, dear father, was her quick protest. To whom do you allege I have exposed your affairs? To your lover, Walter. To Flockhart, whose wits were already at work upon some scheme, to extricate himself there came at that instant a sudden suggestion he spoke causing the old man to start suddenly and turn in the direction of the speaker as the words left his lips he raised a threatening finger towards gabrielle a sign of silence to her of which the old man was unfortunately in ignorance i think sir henry that i ought to speak to tell you the truth painful though it may be five minutes ago i came down here in order to get a telegraph form as I wanted to send a wire at the earliest possible moment to-morrow, when, to my surprise, I saw a light beneath the door. I— Oh, no, no, gasped the girl in horrified protest. It's a lie. I crept in quietly and was very surprised to find Gabrielle with the safe open, and alone. I had expected that she was sitting up late, working with you, but she seemed to be examining and reading some papers she took from a drawer. Forgive me for telling you this, but the truth must now be made plain. I startled her by my sudden presence, and pointing out the dishonor of copying her father's papers, no matter for what purpose, I compelled her to return the documents to their place. I told her, frankly, that it was my duty, as your friend, to inform you of the incident, but she implored me, for the sake of her lover, to remain silent. Mr. Flockhart, cried the girl, how dare you say such a thing, when you know it to be an untruth, when— Enough! exclaimed her father bitterly. I'm ashamed of you, Gabrielle. I—I I would beg of you, Sir Henry, not further to distress yourself, Flockhart interrupted. Love, as you know, often prompts both men and women to commit acts of supreme folly. Folly? echoed the blind man. This is more than folly. Gabrielle and her lover have conspired to bring about my ruin. I have had suspicions for several weeks now. Alas! They are confirmed. Walter Murray is in Paris at this moment in order to make money out of the secret knowledge which Gabrielle obtains for him. My own daughter is responsible for my betrayal, he added in a voice broken by emotion. No, no, Sir Henry, urged Flockhart. Surely the outlook is not so black as you foresee. Gabrielle has acted injudiciously, but surely she is still devoted to you and your interests. Yes, cried the girl in desperation. You know I am, Dad. You know that I— It is useless, Flockhart, for you to endeavor to seek forgiveness for Gabrielle, declared her father in a firm, harsh voice. Quite useless. She has even endeavored to deny the statement you have made. Tried to deny it when I actually heard with my own ears her defiant declaration that she was prepared to bear her shame and its consequences. Let her do so, I say. She shall leave Glencardine tomorrow 
and have no further opportunity to conspire against me oh father what are you saying she cried in despair bursting into tears i have not conspired i am saying the truth went on the blind man you and your lover have formed another clever plot eh because i have not sight to watch you you will copy my business reports and send them to walter murray who hopes to place them in a certain channel where he can receive payment this is not the first time my business has leaked out from this room only a short time ago certain confidential documents were offered to the greek government but fortunately they were false ones prepared on purpose to trick any one who had designs upon my business secrets i swear i'm in ignorance of it all well i have now told you plainly the old man said i loved you gabrielle and until this moment foolishly believed that you were devoted to me and to my interests i trusted you implicitly but you have betrayed me into the hands of my enemies betrayed me he wailed in such a manner that only ruin may face me i tell you the hard and bitter truth i am blind and ever since your return from school you have acted as my secretary and i have looked at the world only through your eyes ah he sighed but i ought to have known i should never have trusted a woman even though she be my own daughter the girl stood with her blanched face covered by her hands to protest to declare that flockhart's story was a lie was she saw all to no purpose her father had overheard her bold defiance and had alas most unfortunately taken it as an admission of her guilt flockhart stood motionless but watchful yet by the few words he uttered he succeeded in impressing the blind man with the genuineness of his friendship both for father and for daughter he urged forgiveness but sir henry disregarded all his appeals no he declared it is fortunate indeed flockhart that you made this discovery and thus placed me upon my guard the poor deluded man little dreamt that on the occasion when flockhart had taken him down the drive to announce his departure from glencardine on account of the gossip and had drawn sir henry's attention to his hanging watch chain he had succeeded in cleverly obtaining two impressions of the safe key attached in his excitement it had never occurred to him to ask his daughter by what means she had been able to open that steel door dad she faltered advancing towards him and placing her soft tender hand upon his shoulder won't you listen to reason i assure you i am quite innocent of any attempt or intention to betray you i know you have many enemies and she glanced quickly in flockhart's direction have we not often discussed them have i not kept eyes and ears open and told you of all i have seen and learnt have you have seen and learnt what is to my detriment he answered all argument is useless a fortnight or so ago by your aid my enemies secured a copy of, of a certain document which has never left yonder safe to-night mr flockhart has discovered you again tampering with my safe and with my own ears i heard you utter defiance you are more devoted to your lover than to me and you are supplying him with copies of my papers that is untrue dad protested the girl reproachfully but her father shook her hand roughly from his shoulder saying i have already told you my decision which is irrevocable to-morrow you shall leave glencardine and go to your aunt emily at woodnewton you won't have much opportunity for mischief in that dull little northampton village i won't allow you to remain under my roof any longer you are too ungrateful and deceitful knowing as you do the misery of my affliction but father go to your room he ordered sternly to-morrow i will speak with your mother and we shall then decide what shall be done only understand one thing in the future you are not my dear daughter that you have been in the past i i have no daughter he added in a voice harsh yet broken by emotion for you now have proved yourself an enemy worse even than those who for so many years have taken advantage of my helplessness ah dad dad you are cruel she cried bursting again into a torrent of tears you are too cruel i have done nothing do you call placing me in peril nothing he retorted bitterly go to your room at once remain with me flockhart i want to speak with you the girl saw herself convicted by those unfortunate words she had used words meant in defiance of her arch-enemy flockhart but which had placed her in ignominy and disgrace 
ah if she could only stand firm and speak the ghastly truth but alas she dared not flockhart the man who held her in his power the man whom she knew to be her father's bitterest opponent a cheat and a fraud stood there triumphant with a smile upon his lips while she pure honest and devoted to that afflicted man was denounced an outcast she raised her voice in one last word of faint protest but her father angered and grieved turned fiercely upon her and ordered her from his presence go he said and do not come near me again until your boxes are packed and you are ready to leave glencardine you speak as though i were a servant whom you've discharged she said bitterly i am speaking to my enemy not to my daughter was his hard response she raised her eyes to flockhart and saw upon his dark face a hard sphinx-like look what hope of salvation could she ever expect from that man the man who long ago had sought to estrange her from her father so that he might work his own ends it was upon her tongue to turn upon him and relate the whole infamous truth yet so friendly had the two become of late that she feared even if she did so that her father would only see in the revelation an attempt at reprisal besides what if flockhart spoke what if he told the awful truth her dear father whom she loved so well even though he had misjudged her would be dragged into the mire no she was the victim of that man who was a past master of the art of subterfuge the man who for years had lived by his wits and preyed upon society leave us and go to your room again commanded her father she looked sadly at the white bespeckled countenance which she loved so well her soft hand once more sought his but he cast it from him saying enough of your caresses you are no longer my daughter leave us and then seeing all protest in vain she sighed turned very slowly and with a last lingering look upon the helpless man to whom she had been so devoted and who now so grossly misjudged her she tottered out closing the door behind her has she gone asked sir henry a moment later flockhart responded in the affirmative laying his hand upon the shoulder of his agitated host and urging him to remain calm that's all very well my dear flockhart he cried but you don't know what she has done she exposed a week or so ago a most confidential arrangement with the greek government a revelation which might have involved me in the loss of over a hundred thousand then it's fortunate perhaps that i discovered her to-night replied his guest all this must be very painful to you sir henry very i shall not give her another opportunity to betray me flockhart depend on that the elder man said my wife warned me against gabrielle long ago i now see that i was a fool for not taking her advice certainly it is a curious fact that walter murray is in paris remarked the other was the revelation of your financial dealings made in paris do you know yes it was snapped the blind man i believed walter to be quite a good young fellow ah i know the difference sir henry his life up in london was not well not exactly all that it should be he's in with a rather shady crowd you never told me so because you did not believe me to be your friend until quite recently i hope i have now proved what i have asserted if i can do anything to assist you i am only too ready i assure you that you have only to command me sir henry reflected deeply for a few moments the discovery that his daughter was playing him false caused within him a sudden revulsion of feeling unfortunately he could not see the expression upon the countenance of his false friend he was wondering at that moment whether he might entrust to him a somewhat delicate mission gabrielle shall not return here her father said as though speaking to himself that is a course which i would most strongly advise send the girl away urged the other evidently she has grossly betrayed you that i certainly intend doing was the answer but i wonder flockhart if i might take you at your word and ask you to do me a favor i am so helpless or i would not think of troubling you only tell me what you wish and i will do it with pleasure very well then replied the blind man perhaps i shall want you to go to paris at once watch the actions of young murray and report to me from time to time would you a look of bright intelligence overspread the man's features as a new vista opened before him sir henry was about to take him into his confidence why with pleasure he said cheerily i'll start to-morrow 
and rest assured that i'll keep a very good eye upon the young gentleman you now know the painful truth concerning your daughter the truth which lady Hayburn has told you so often and which you have never yet heeded yes flockhart answered the afflicted man taking his guest's hand in warm friendship i once disliked you that i admit but you were quite frank the other day and now to-night you have succeeded in making a discovery that though it has upset me terribly may mean my salvation End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain through the mists sir henry refused to speak with his daughter when on the following morning she stole in and laid her hand softly upon his arm he ordered her in a tone quite unusual to leave the library through the morning hours she had lain awake trying to make a resolve but alas she dared not tell the truth she was in deadly fear of flockhart's reprisals that morning at nine o'clock lady Hayburn and flockhart had held hurried consultation in secret at which she had explained to her what had occurred excellent she had remarked briefly but we must now have a care my dear friend mind the girl does not throw all prudence to the winds and turn upon us bah he laughed i don't fear that for a single second and he left the room again to salute her in the breakfast room a quarter of an hour later as though they had not met before that day gabrielle on leaving her father went out for a long walk alone away over the heather-clad hills for hours she went on jock her aberdeen terrier toddling at her side in her hand a stout ash stick regardless of the muddy roads or the wet weather it was gray damp and dismal one of those days which in the highlands are often so very cheerless and dispiriting yet on and still on she went her mind full of the events of the previous night full also of the dread secret which prevented her from exposing her father's false friend in order to save her father should she sacrifice herself sacrifice her own life that was the one problem before her she saw nothing she heeded nothing hunger or fatigue troubled her not indeed she took no notice of where her footsteps led her beyond creef she wandered along the river bank a short distance ascending a hill where a wild and wonderful view spread before her there she sat down upon a big boulder to rest her hair blown by the chill wind she sat staring straight before her thinking ever thinking she had not seen lady Hayburn that day she had seen no one at six o'clock that morning she had written a long letter to walter murray she had not mentioned the midnight incident but she had with many expressions of regret pointed out the futility of any further affection between them she had not attempted to excuse herself she merely told him that she considered herself unworthy of his love and because of that and that alone she had decided to break off their engagement a dozen times she had reread the letter after she had completed it surely it was the letter of a heartbroken and desperate woman would he take it in the spirit in which it was meant she wondered she loved him ah loved him better than any one else in all the world but she now saw that it was useless to masquerade any longer the blow had fallen and it had crushed her she was powerless to resist powerless to deny the false charge against her powerless to tell the truth that letter which she knew must come as a cruel blow to walter she had given to the postman with her own hands and it was now on its way south as she sat on the summit of the heather-clad hill she wondered what effect her written words would have upon him he had loved her so devotedly ever since they had been children together well she knew how strong was his passion for her how his life was at her disposal she knew that on reading those despairing lines of hers he would be staggered she recalled the dear face of her soulmate his hot kisses his soft terms of endearment and alone there with none to witness her bitter grief she burst into a flood of tears the sad grayness of the landscape was in keeping with her own great sorrow she had lost all that was dear to her and young as she was 
with hardly any experience of the world and its ways she was already the victim of grim circumstance broken by the grief of a self-renounced love gnawing at her true heart the knowledge that lady heyburn and flockhart would exult over her downfall and exile to that tiny house in a sleepy little northamptonshire village did not trouble her her enemies had triumphed she had played the game and lost just as she might have lost at billiards or at bridge for she was a thorough sportswoman she only grieved because she saw the grave peril of her dear father and because she now foresaw the utter hopelessness of her own happiness it was better she reflected far better that she should go into the dull and dreary exile of an english village with the unexciting companionship of aunt emily an ascetic spinster of the mid-victorian era and make pretence of pique with walter than to reveal to him the shameful truth he would at least in those circumstances retain of her a recollection fond and tender he would not despise nor hate her as he most certainly would do if he knew the real astounding facts how long she remained there high up with the chill winds of autumn tossing her silky light brown hair she knew not rain clouds were gathering and the rugged hill before her was now hidden behind a, a bank of mist time had crept on without her heeding it for what did time now matter to her what indeed did anything matter her young life though she was still in her teens had ended or at least as far as she was concerned it had was she not calmly and coolly contemplating telling the truth and putting an end to her existence after saving her father's honour her sad tearful eyes gazed slowly about her as she suddenly awakened to the fact that she was far very far from home she had been dazed unconscious of everything because of the heavy burden of grief within her heart but now she looked forth upon the small grey loch with its dark fringe of trees the grey and purple hills beyond the grey sky and the grey filmy mists that hung everywhere the world was indeed sad and gloomy and even jock sat looking up at his young mistress as though regarding her grief and wonder now and then distant shots came from across the hills they were shooting over the drummond estate she knew for she had had an invitation to join their luncheon party that day lady heyburn and flockhart had no doubt gone that she told herself was her last day in the highlands that picturesque breezy country she loved so well it was her last day amid those familiar places where she and walter had so often wandered together and where he had told her of his passionate devotion well perhaps it was best after all down south she would not be reminded of him every moment and at every turn no she sighed within herself as she rose to descend the hill she must steel herself against her own sad reflections she must learn how to forget what will he say she murmured aloud as she went down with jock frisking and barking before her what will he think of me when he gets my letter he will believe me fickle he will believe that i have another lover that is certain well i must allow him to believe it we have parted and we must now alas remain apart for ever probably he will seek from my father the truth concerning my disappearance from glencardine dad will tell him no doubt and then then what will he believe he he will know that i am unworthy to be his wife yet yet it is not cruel that i dare not speak the truth and clear myself of this foul charge of betraying my own dear father was ever a girl placed in such a position as myself i wonder has any girl ever loved a man better than i love walter her white lips were set hard and her fine eyes became again bedimmed by tears it commenced to rain that fine drizzle so often experienced north of the tweed but he heeded not she was used to it to get wet through was to her quite a frequent occurrence when out fishing though there was no path she knew her way and walking through the wet heather she came after half an hour out upon a muddy by-road which led her into the town of creef once her return was easy though it was already dusk and the dressing bell had gone before she re-entered the house by the servant's door and slipped unobserved up to her own room elise found her seated in her blue gown before the welcome fire log her chin upon her breast her excuse was that she felt unwell therefore one of the maids brought her some dinner on a tray upon the mantel-shelf were many photographs some of them snapshots of her schoolfellows and souvenirs of holidays 
the odds and ends of portraits and scenes which every girl unconsciously collects among them in a plain silver frame was the picture of walter murray taking in new york only a few weeks before upon the frame was engraved gabrielle farm walter she took it in her hand and stood for a long time motionless never again alas would she look upon that face so dear to her her young heart was already broken because she was held fettered and powerless at last she put down the portrait and sinking into her chair sat crying bitterly now that she was outcast by her father to whom she had been always such a close devoted friend her life was an absolute blank at one blow she had lost both lover and father already elise had told her that she had received instructions to pack her trunks the thin-nosed frenchwoman was apparently much puzzled at the order which lady Hayburn had given her and had asked the girl whom she intended to visit the maid had asked what dresses she would require but gabrielle replied that she might pack what she liked for a long visit the girl could hear elise moving about shaking out skirts in the adjoining room and making preparations for her departure on the morrow despondent hopeless grief-stricken she sat before the fire for a long time she had locked the door and switched off the light for it irritated her she loved the uncertain light of dancing flames and sat huddled there in her big chair for the last time she was reflecting upon her own brief life scarcely out of the schoolroom she had lived most of her days up in that dear old place where every inch of the big estate was so familiar to her she remembered all those happy days at school first in england and then in france with the kind-faced sisters in their spotless headdresses and the quiet happy life of the convent the calm grave face of sister marguerite looked down upon her from the mantel-shelf as if in sympathizing with her pretty pupil in those troubles that had come so early to her she raised her eyes and she saw the portrait its sight aroused within her a new thought and fresh recollection had not sister marguerite always taught her to beseech the almighty's aid when in doubt or when in trouble those grave solemn words of the mother superior rang in her ears and she fell upon her knees beside her narrow bed in the alcove and with murmuring lips prayed for divine support and assistance she raised her sweet troubled face to heaven and made confession to her maker then after a long silence she struggled again to her feet more cool and more collected she took up walter's portrait and kissing it put it away carefully in a drawer some of her little treasures she gathered together and placed with it preparatory to departure for she would on the morrow leave glencardine perhaps for ever the stable clock had struck ten to where she stood came the strident sounds of the mechanical piano player for some of the gay party were waltzing in the hall their merry shouts and laughter were discordant to her ears what cared any of those friends of her stepmother if she were in disgrace and an outcast drawing aside the curtain she saw that the night was bright and starlit she preferred the air out in the park to the sounds of gaiety within that house which was no longer to be her home therefore she slipped on a skirt and blouse and throwing her golf cape across her shoulders and a shawl over her head she crept past the room wherein elise was packing her belongings and down the back stairs to the lawn the sound of the laughter of the men and women of the shooting party aroused a poignant bitterness within her as she passed across the drive she saw a light in the library where no doubt her father was sitting in his loneliness filling and examining his collection of seal impressions she turned and walking straight on struck the gravelled path which took her to the castle ruins not until the black ponderous walls rose before her did she awaken to a consciousness of her whereabouts then entering the ruined courtyard she halted and listened all was dark above the stars twinkled brightly and in the ivy the night-birds stirred the leaves holding her breath she strained her ears yes she was not deceived there were sounds distinct and undeniable she was fascinated listening again to those shadow voices that were always precursory of death the fatal whispers end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain by the mediterranean it was february not the foggy muddy february of dear damp old england but winter beside the bright blue mediterranean 
the Cote d'Azur, at the Villa Hayburn, that big square white house with the green sun shutters, surrounded by its great garden full of spreading palms, sweet-smelling mimosa, orange trees laden with golden fruit and bright geraniums, up on the Burrigo at San Remo. Lady Hayburn had that afternoon given a big luncheon party. The smartest people wintering in that most sheltered nook of the Italian Riviera had eaten and gossiped and flirted, and gone back to their villas and hotels. Dull persons found no place in Lady Hayburn's circle. Most of the people were those she knew in London or in Paris, including a sprinkling of cosmopolitans, a Russian prince notorious for his losses over at the new circle at Cannes, a divorced Austrian archduchess, and two or three well-known diplomats. Dear old Henry remained, of course, at Glencardine, as he always did. Lady Hayburn looked upon her winter visit to that beautiful villa overlooking the calm sapphire sea as her annual emancipation. Henry was a dear old fellow, she openly confided to her friends, but his affliction made him terribly trying. But Jimmy Flockhart, the good-looking, amusing, well-dressed idler, was living down at the Savoy and was daily in her company, driving, motoring, picnicking, making excursions in the mountains or taking trips over to Monte by the train de luxe. He had left the villa early in the afternoon, returned to his hotel, changed his smart flannels for a tweed suit, and taking a stout stick, had set off alone for his daily constitutional along the sea road in the direction of that pretty but half-deserted little watering place, Hospitality. Straight before him, into the unruffled tideless sea, the sun was sinking in all its blood-red glory, as he went at swinging pace along the white, dusty road, past the octroi barrier, and out into the country where, on the left, the waves lazily lapped the gray rocks, while upon the right the fertile slopes were covered with carnations and violets, growing for the markets of Paris and London. In the air was a delightful perfume, the freshness of the sea in combination with the sweetness of the flowers. A big red motor-car dashed suddenly round a corner, raising a cloud of dust. An American party were on their way from Genoa to the frontier along the Corniche, one of the most picturesque routes in all the world. James Flockhart had no eyes for beauty. He was too occupied by certain grave apprehensions. That morning he had walked in the garden with Lady Hayburn and had a long chat with her. Her attitude had been peculiar. He could not make her out. She had begged him to promise to leave San Remo, and when he asked to tell the reason, of this sudden demand, she had firmly refused. You must leave here, Jimmy, she said quite calmly. Go down to Rome, to Palermo, to Ragusa, or somewhere where you can put in a month or so in comfort. The Villa Igea at Palermo would suit you quite well. Lots of smart people and very decent cooking. Well, he laughed, as far as hotels go, nothing could be worse than this place. I'd never put my nose into this hole if it were not for the fact that you come here. There isn't a hotel worth the name. When one goes to Monte, or Cannes, or even decaying Nice, one can get decent cooking, but here, ugh, and he shrugged his shoulders. Price higher than the Ritz in Paris, food fourth-rate, rooms cheaply decorated, and a dullness unequaled. My dear Jimmy, laughed her ladyship, you're such a cosmopolitan that you're incorrigible. I know you don't like this place. You've been here six weeks, so go. You've had a letter from the old man, eh? Yes, I have, she replied, and he saw that her countenance changed, but she would say nothing more. She had decided that he must leave San Remo and would hear no argument to the contrary. The southern sun sank slowly into the sea, now gray but waveless. On the horizon lay the long smoke trail of a passing steamer eastward bound. He had rounded the steep rocky headland, and in the hollow before him nestled the little village of Ospedaletti with its closed casino, its rows of small villas, and its palm-lined passeggiata. A hundred yards further, he saw the figure of a rather shabby, middle-aged man, in a faded gray overcoat and gray, soft felt hat of the mode, usual on the Riviera, but discolored by long wear, leaning upon the low sea-wall and smoking a cigarette. No other person was in the vicinity, and it was quickly evident from the manner in which the wayfarer recognized him and came forward to meet him with outstretched hand that they had met by appointment 
short of stature as he was with fair hair colourless eyes and a fair moustache his slouching appearance was that of one who had seen better days even though there still remained about him a vestige of dandyism the close observer would however detect that his clothes shabby though they were were of foreign cut that his greeting was of that demonstrative character that betrayed his foreign birth welcome my dear crail exclaimed flockart after they had shaken hands and stood together leaning upon the sea-wall you got my wire in huntingdon i was uncertain whether you were at the george or at the fountain so i sent a message to both i was at the george and left an hour after receipt of your wire well tell me what has happened how are things up at glencardine goslin is with the old fellow he has taken the girl's place as his confidential secretary was the shabby man's reply speaking with a foreign accent walter murray was at home for christmas but went to cairo and how are matters in paris they are working hard but it's an uphill pull the old man is a crafty old bird those papers you got from the safe had been cunningly prepared for anybody who sought to obtain information the consequence is, is that we've shown our hand and heavily handicapped ourselves thereby you told me all that when you were down here a month ago flockhart said impatiently you didn't believe me then you do now i suppose i've never denied it flockhart declared offering the stranger a russian cigarette from his gold case i was completely misled and by the girl also the girl's influence with her father is happily quite at an end remarked the shabby man i saw her last week in wood newton the change from glencardine to an eight-room cottage in a village street must be rather severe only what she deserves snapped flockhart she defied us granted but i cannot help thinking that we haven't played a very fair game said the man remember she's only a girl but dangerous to us and to our plans my dear crail she knows a lot because she will forgive me for saying so my dear flockhart because you've been a fool and have allowed her to know it was not i it was the woman lady hayburn why i always believed her to be the soul of discretion she's been too defiant of consequences a dozen times i've warned her but she will not heed then she'll land herself in a deep hole if she isn't careful replied the foreigner speaking very fair english does she know i'm here of course not if we're to play the game she must know nothing she's already inclined to throw prudence to the winds and to confess all to her husband confess gasped the stranger paling beneath his rather sallow skin for bacco she's not going to be such an idiot surely we were run so close and so narrowly escaped discovery after i got at those papers at glencardine that she seems to have lost her heart flockhart remarked but if she acted the fool and told sir sir henry it would mean ruin for us and that would also mean it would mean exposure for gabrielle interrupted flockhart the old man dare not lift his voice for his daughter's sake ah exclaimed crail that's just where you've acted injudiciously you've set him against her therefore he wouldn't spare her it was imperative i couldn't afford to be found prying into the old man's papers could i i got impressions of his key while walking in the park one day he's never suspected it of course not he believes in you laughed his friend as one of the few upright men who are his friends but he added you've done wrong my dear fellow to trust a woman with a secret depend upon it her ladyship will let you down well if she does remarked flockhart with a shrug of the shoulders she'll have to suffer with me you know where we should all find ourselves the man pulled a wry face and puffed at his cigarette in silence what does the girl do asked flockhart a few moments later well she seems to have a pretty dull time with the old lady i stayed at the cardigan arms at woodnewton for two days a miserable little place and watched her pretty closely she's out a good deal rambling alone across the country with a collie belonging to a neighboring farmer she's the very picture of sadness poor little girl you seem to sympathize with her crail why does she not stand between us any fortune she'll stand between us any court of a size if that woman acts the fool declared the shabby stranger who moved so rapidly and whose vigilance seemed unequalled if we go she shall go also flockhart declared in a threatening voice but you must prevent such a contretemps crail urged ah 
it's all very well to talk like that but you know enough of her ladyship to be aware that she acts on her own initiative that shows that she's no fool remarked the foreigner quickly you who hold her in the hollow of your hand must prevent her from opening up to her husband the whole future lies with you and what is the future without money we want a few thousands for immediate necessities both of us the woman's allowance from her husband is nowadays a mere bagatelle because he probably knows that some of her money has gone into your pockets my dear boy no he's completely in ignorance of that how indeed could he know she takes very good care that there's no possibility of his finding out well remarked the stranger that's what i fear has happened or may one day happen the fact is caro mio we're in a quandary at the present moment you were a bit too confident in dealing with those documents you found at glencardine you should have taken her ladyship into your confidence and got her to pump her husband concerning them if you had we shouldn't have made the mess of it we have done i must admit crail that what you say is true declared the well-dressed man you are such a philosopher always i asked you to come here in secret to explain the exact position it is one of peril we are checkmated goslin holds the whole position in his hands and will keep it very fortunately for you he doesn't though we were very near exposure when i went out to athens and made a fool of myself upon the report furnished by you i believed it to be a genuine one i had no idea that the old man was so crafty exactly and if he displayed such clever ingenuity and forethought in laying a trap for the inquisitive is it not more than likely that there may be other traps baited with equal craft and cunning then how are we to make the coup flockhart asked looking into the colourless eyes of his friend we shall i fear never make it unless unless what he asked unless the old man meets with an accident replied the other in a low distinct voice blind men sometimes do you know end of chapter twenty two chapter number twenty three of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain which shows a shabby foreigner felix crail his cigarette held halfway to his lips stood watching the effect of his insinuation he saw a faint smile playing about flockhart's lips and knew that it appealed to him old sir henry hayburn had laid a clever trap for him a trap into which he himself believed that his daughter had fallen why should not flockhart retaliate the shabby stranger whose own ingenuity and double dealing were a little short of marvellous and under whose watchful vigilance the hayburn household had been ever since her ladyship and her friend flockhart had gone south stood silent but in complete satisfaction the well-dressed riviera lounger the man so well known at all the various gay resorts from ventimiglia along to cannes and who was a member of the fete committee at san remo and at nice merely exchanged glances with his friend and smiled quickly however he changed the topic of conversation and what's occurring in paris ah uh, there we have the puzzle replied the man Crail, his accent being an unfamiliar one so unfamiliar indeed that those unacquainted with the truth were always placed in doubt regarding his true nationality but you have made inquiry asked his friend quickly of course but the business is kept far too close every precaution is taken to prevent anything leaking out Crail responded the clerks will speak won't they the other said mon cher ami they know no more of the business of the mysterious firm of which the blind baronet is the head than we do ourselves said Crail. they make enormous financial deals that's very certain not deals but coups for themselves he laughed correcting flockhart recollect what i discovered in athens and the extraordinary connection you found in brussels ah yes you mean that clever crowd four men and two women who were working the gambling concession from the dutch government exclaimed flockhart yes that was a complete mystery they sent wires in cipher to sir henry at glencardine i managed to get a glance at one of them and it was signed metaphoros that's their paris cable address said his companion surely you with your network of sources of information and your own genius for discovering secrets ought to be able to reveal the true nature of sir henry's business 
is it an honest one asked flockhart i think not think why my dear felix this isn't like you only to think you always know you're so certain about your facts that i've always banked upon them the other gave his shoulders a shrug of indecision it was not a judicious move on your part to get rid of the girl from glencardine he said slowly while she was there we had a chance of getting at some clue but now old goslin has taken her place we may just as well abandon investigation at that end you failed crail and attribute your failure to me protested his companion how could i risk being ignominiously kicked out of glencardine as a spy whatever attitude you might have taken would have had the same result we used the information and found ourselves fooled tricked by a very crafty old man who actually prepared those documents in case he was betrayed admitted said flockhart but even though we made fools of ourselves in athens and caused the greek government to look upon us as rogues and liars the girl is suspected and i for one don't mean to give in before we've secured a nice snug little sum how are we to do it by obtaining knowledge of the game being played in paris and working in an opposite direction flockhart replied we are agreed upon one point that for the past few years ever since goslin came on the scene sir henry's business a big one there is no doubt has been of a mysterious and therefore shady character by his confidence in gabrielle his care that nobody ever got a chance inside that safe his regular consultations with goslin who travelled from paris specially to see him his constant telegrams in cipher and his refusal to allow even his wife to obtain the slightest inkling into his private affairs it is shown that he fears exposure do you agree most certainly i do well any man who is in dread of the truth becoming known must be carrying on some negotiations the reverse of creditable he is the moving spirit of that shady house without a doubt declared flockhart who had so often grasped the blind man's hand in friendship in such fear that his transaction should become known and that exposure might result he actually had prepared documents on purpose to mislead those who pried into his affairs therefore the instant we discover the truth fortune will be at our hand we all want money you i and lady hayburn and money will have with these sentiments my dear friend i entirely and absolutely agree remarked the shabby man lighting a fresh cigarette but one fact you seem to have entirely overlooked what the girl she stands between you and she might come back into the old man's favor you know and even though she did that makes no difference flockhart answered defiantly why because she dare not say a single word against me crail looked him straight in the face with considerable surprise but made no comment she knows better flockhart added never believe too much in your own power with a woman mon cher ami remarked the other dubiously she's young therefore of a romantic turn of mind she's in love remember which makes matters much worse for us why because being in love she may become seized with a sentimental fit this ends generally in a determination of self-sacrifice and in such case she would tell the truth in defiance of you and would be heedless of her own danger flockhart drew a long breath what this man said was he knew within his own heart only too true of the girl toward whom they had been so cruel and so unscrupulous his had been a lifelong scheme and as part of his scheme in conjunction with the woman who was sir henry's wife it had been unfortunately compulsory to sacrifice the girl who was the blind man's right hand yes gabrielle was deeply in love with walter murray the man upon whom sir henry now looked as his enemy and who would have exposed him to the greek government if the blind man had not been too clever the baronet after his daughter's confession naturally attributed her curiosity to walter's initiative the more especially that walter had been in paris and it was believed in athens also the pair were however now separated crail in pursuit of his diligent inquiries had actually been in wood newton and seen the lonely little figure sat and dejected taking long rambles accompanied only by a farmer's sheepdog young murray had not been there nor did the pair now correspond this much crail had himself discovered the problem placed before flockhart by his shabby friend was a somewhat disconcerting one on the one hand lady hayburn had urged him to leave the riviera without giving him any reason and on the other 
he had the ever-present danger of gabrielle in a sudden fit of sentimental self-sacrifice giving him away if she did what then the mere suggestion caused him to bite his nether lip Crail knew a good deal but he did not know it all perhaps it was as well that he did not there is a code of honour among adventurers all the world over but few of them can resist the practice of blackmail when they chance to fall upon evil days yes flockhart said reflectively as at Crail's suggestion they turned and began to descend the steep hill towards ospedaletti perhaps it's a pity after all that the girl left glencardine yet surely she's safer with her aunt she was driven from glencardine by her father you sacrificed her in order to save yourself that was but natural it's a pity however you didn't take my advice i suggested it to lady heyburn but she would have nothing to do with it she declared that such a course was far too dangerous dangerous echoed the shabby man surely it could not have placed either of you in any greater danger than you are in already she didn't like it few people do laughed the other but depend upon it it's the only way she wouldn't at any rate have had an opportunity of telling the truth flockhart pulled a wry face and after a silence of a few moments said don't let us discuss that we fully considered all the pros and cons at the time her ladyship is growing scrupulously honest of late sneered his companion she'll try to get rid of you very soon i expect the latter sentence was more full of meaning than the speaker dreamed the words falling upon flockhart's ears caused him to wince was her ladyship really trying to rid herself of his influence he laughed within himself at the thought of her endeavouring to release herself from the bond for her he had never at any moment entertained either admiration or affection their association had always been purely one of business business be it said in which he made the profits and she the losses it would hardly be an easy matter for her replied the easy-going audacious adventurer she seems to be very popular up at glencardine remarked the foreigner because she's extravagant and spends money in the neighbourhood i suppose but the people in octeradar village criticise her treatment of gabrielle they hear gossip from the servants i expect they should know of the girl's treatment of her stepmother exclaimed Lockhart. but their villagers are always prone to listen to and embroider any stories concerning the private life of the gentry it's just the same in scotland as in any other country in the world ah continued flockhart in scotland the old families are gradually decaying and their estates are falling into the hands of blatant parvenus counter jumpers stock deer nowadays and city clerks on their holidays shoot over peers's preserves the humble scot sees it all with regret because he has no real liking for this latter-day invasion by the newly rich english cotton spinners from lancashire by dear forests and soap boilers from limehouse purchase castles with family portraits and ghosts complete ah speaking of the supernatural exclaimed Crail suddenly do you know i had a most extraordinary and weird experience when at glencardine about three weeks ago i actually heard the whispers flockhart stared hard at the man at his side and laughing outright said well that's the best joke i've heard today you have all meant to be taken in by a mere superstition but my dear friend i heard them said Crail. i swear i actually heard them and i well i admit to you even though you may laugh at me for being a superstitious fool i somehow anticipate that something uncanny is about to happen to me you're going to die like all the rest of them i suppose laughed his friend as they descended the dusty winding road that led to the palm-lined promenade of the quiet little mediterranean watering place end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain when greek meets greek on their left were several white villas before which pink and scarlet geraniums ran riot with spreading mimosas golden with their feathery blossom for ospedaletti makes a frantic if vain bid for popularity as a winter resort its deadly dullness however is too well known for the habitui of the riviera and its casino which never obtained a license imparts to it the air of painful effort at gaiety 
well remarked the shabby man as they passed along and out upon the sea road in the direction of bordaguera i always looked upon what the people at octeradar said regarding the whispers as a mere myth but now having heard them with my own ears how can i have further doubt i listened in the castle ruins a good many times my dear crail replied the other but i've never heard anything more exciting than an owl indeed lady hayburn and i when there was so much gossip about the strange noises some two years ago set to work to investigate we went there at least a dozen times but without result only both of us caught bad colds well exclaimed crail i used to ridicule the weird stories i heard in the village about the devil's whisper and all that but by mere chance i happened to be at the spot one bright night and i heard distinct whisperings just as had been described to me they gave me a very creepy feeling i can assure you bosh now do you believe in ghosts you man of the world that you are my dear felix no most decidedly i don't then what you've heard is only an imagination depend upon it the supernatural doesn't exist in glencardine that's quite certain declared flockhart the fact is that there's so much tradition and legendary lore connected with the old place and its early owners were such a set of bold and defiant robbers that for generations the peasantry have held it in awe hence all sorts of weird and terrible stories have been invented and handed down until the present age believes them to be based upon fact but my dear friend i actually heard the whispers heard them with my own ears Crail asserted i happened to be about the place that night trying to get a peep into the library where goslin and the old man were i believe busy at work but the blinds fitted too closely so that i couldn't see inside the keeper and his men were i knew down in the village therefore i took a stroll towards the ruins and as it was a beautiful night i sat down in the courtyard to have a smoke then of a sudden i heard low voices quite distinctly they startled me for not until they fell upon my ears did i recall the stories told to me weeks before if stuart or any of the underkeepers had found you prowling about the castle grounds at that hour they might have asked you awkward questions remarked flockhart oh laughed the other they all knew me as a visitor to the village fond of walking exercise i took very good care that they should all know me so that as few explanations as possible would be necessary as you well know the secret of all my successes is that i never leave anything to chance to go peeping outside the house and trying to look in at lighted windows sounds a rather injudicious proceeding his companion declared not if proper precautions are taken as i took them i was weeks in that terribly dull scotch village but nobody suspected my real mission i made quite a large circle of friends at the star who all believed me to be a foreign ornithologist writing a book upon the birds of scotland trust me to tell people a good story well exclaimed flockhart after a long silence those whispers are certainly a mystery more especially if you've actually heard them on two or three occasions i've spoken to sir henry about them he ridicules the idea yet he admitted to me one evening that the voices had really been heard i declared that the most remarkable fact was the sudden death of each person who had listened and heard them it is a curious phenomenon which certainly should be investigated the inference is that i having listened to the ghostly voices am doomed to a sudden and violent end remarked the shabby stranger quite gloomily flockhart laughed really felix this is too funny he said fancy your taking notice of such old wives as fables why my dear fellow you've got many years of constant activity before you you must return to paris in the morning and watch in patience i have watched but discovered nothing perhaps i'll come and assist you most probably i shall no don't as soon as you leave san remo sir henry will know and he might suspect suspect what that you are in search of the truth and of fortune in consequence he believes in me only the other day i had a letter from him written in goslin's hand repeating the confidence he reposes in me exactly you must remain down here for the present 
flockart recollected the puzzling decision of lady heyburn and remained silent our chief peril is still the one which has faced us all along went on the man in the gray hat the peril that the girl may tell about that awkward affair at chantilly she dare not flockart assured him quickly frail shook his head dubiously she's leading a lonely life her heart is broken and she believes herself as every other young girl does to be without a future therefore she's brooding over it one never knows in such cases when a girl may fling all prudence to the winds he said if she did then nothing could save us that's just what her ladyship said the other day answered flockart tossing away his cigarette but you don't know that i hold her irrevocably she dare not say a single word if she dare why did she not tell the truth about the safe probably because it was all too sudden she now finds life in that dismal little village intolerable she's a girl of spirit you know and has always been used to luxury and freedom to live with an old woman in a country cottage away from all her friends must be maddening no my dear james in this you've acted most injudiciously you were devoid of your usual foresight depend upon it a very serious danger threatens she will speak i tell you she dare not rest your mind assured she will she shall not how pray can you close her mouth asked the foreigner flockart's eyes met his in them was a curious expression almost a glitter crail understood he shrugged his shoulders but uttered no word his gesture was however that of one unconvinced adventurer as he was ingenious and unscrupulous he lived from hand to mouth sometimes he made a big coup and placed himself in funds but following such an event he was open-handed and generous to his friends extravagant in his expenditure and very soon found himself under the necessity to exercise his wits in order to obtain the next louis he had known flockart for years as one of his own class they had first met long ago on board a castle liner homeward bound from cape town where both found themselves playing a crooked game a friendship begotten of dishonesty had sprung up between them and in consequence they had thrown in their lot together more than once with considerable financial advantage the present affair was however not much to crail's liking and this he had more than once told his friend it was quite possible that if they could discover the mysterious source of the blind man's wealth they might by judiciously levying blackmail through a third party secure a very handsome income which he was to share with flockart and her ladyship the last named crail had always admitted to be one of the cleverest women he had ever met his only surprise had been that she as sir henry's wife was unable to get at the facts which were so cleverly withheld it only showed however that the baronet though deprived of eyesight was even more clever than the unscrupulous woman he had so foolishly married crail held lady heyburn in distinct distrust he had once had dealings with her which had turned out the reverse of satisfactory instinctively he knew that in order to save herself if exposure ever came she would give him away without the least compunction what had puzzled him for several years and what indeed had puzzled other people was the reason of the close friendship between flockart and the baronet's wife it was certainly not affection he knew flockart intimately and had knowledge of his private affairs therefore he was well aware of the existence of an unknown and rather insignificant woman to whom he was in secret devoted no the bond between the pair was an entirely mysterious one he knew that on more than one occasion when flockart's demands for money had been a little too frequent she had resisted and attempted to withdraw from further association with him yet by a single word or even a look he could compel her to disgorge the funds he needed for she had even handed him some of her trinkets to pawn until she could obtain further funds from sir henry to redeem them as they walked together along the white corniche road their faces set towards the gorgeous southern afterglow while the waves lapped lazily on the gray rocks all these puzzling thoughts recurred to crail lady heyburn seems still to remain your very devoted friend he remarked at last with a meaning smile i see from the new york herald what pleasant parties she gives and how she is the heart and soul of social merriment in san remo 
by jove james you're a lucky man to possess such a popular hostess as a friend yes laughed flockhart winnie is a regular pal without her i should have been broken long ago but she's always ready to help me along people have already remarked upon your remarkable friendship said his friend and many ill-natured allegations have been made oh yes i'm quite aware of that my dear fellow it has pained me more than enough you yourself know that as far as affection goes i've never in my life entertained a spark of it for a winnie we were children together and have been friends always quite so exclaimed crail smiling that's a pretty good story to tell the world but there's a point where mere friendship must break you know what do you mean asked the other glancing at him in surprise well the story you tell other people must be picturesque and romantic but with me it's just a trifle weak lady hayburn doesn't give her pearls to be pawned out of mere friendship you know flockhart was silent he knew too well that the man walking at his side was as clever an intriguer and as bold an adventurer as ever had moved up and down europe working the game in search of pigeons to pluck his shabbiness was assumed he had alighted at bordighera station from the rapide from paris spent the night at a third-rate hotel in order not to be recognized at the angst or any of the smarter houses and had met him by appointment to explain the present situation his remarks however were the reverse of reassuring what did he suspect i don't quite follow you crail flockhart said i meant to imply that if friendship only links you with lady hayburn the chain may quite easily snap he remarked he looked at his friend much puzzled he could see no point in that observation crail read what was passing in the other's mind and added i know mon cher ami that affection from her ladyship is entirely out of the question the gossips are liars and sir henry himself is quite aware of that i have already spoken quite plainly and openly to him and suggested my departure from glencardine on account of ill-natured remarks by her ladyship's enemies but he would not hear of my leaving and press me to remain crail looked up at him in blank surprise well he said if you've been bold enough to do this in the face of gossip then you're a much cleverer man than i ever took you to be for answer flockhart took some letters from his breast pocket selected one written in a foreign hand and gave it to crail to read it was from the hermit of glencardine written at his dictation by monsieur goslin and was couched in the warmest and most confidential terms look here james exclaimed the shabby man handing back the letter i'm going to be perfectly frank with you tell me if i speak the truth or if i lie it is neither affection nor friendship which links your life with that woman's am i right flockhart did not answer for some moments his eyes were cast upon the ground yes crail he admitted at last when the question had been put to him a second time yes crail you speak the truth it is neither affection nor friendship End of chapter twenty four